Influenza and pneumonia combined is the eighth leading cause of death in the U.S. Over 57,000 people die in the U.S. from influenza and pneumonia per year. 85% of these deaths occur in those over the age of 65. In 2010, there was more than 1 million hospitalizations due to pneumonia and another 7,000 due to influenza. In the U.S., influenza affects 5 to 20 percent of the population annually. Pneumonia is the most common cause of serious illness and death in young children worldwide. In 2013, nearly $20 billion was spent on influenza and pneumonia health care in the U.S. It's that time of the year again, flu season. Well, I guess it may be depending on when you're watching this video. So what is influenza? It is a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. It poses a major threat to human health. No one can predict the severity of any flu season, including a pandemic season. Commonly known as the flu, influenza is an infectious disease caused by a virus. Viruses are microscopically small germs, even smaller than bacteria. After entering the body, they multiply very quickly. The body's immune system takes some time to produce antibodies to fight the viral infection. There are hundreds of flu viruses belonging to different groups. Influenza A and B are the most dangerous. If you are infected with a particular virus, you will be immune to that virus once you get better. The symptoms of influenza can be mild to severe. The most common symptoms include high fever, runny nose, sore throat, muscle pain, headaches, coughing, and feeling tired. Most influenza infections are not fatal and the symptoms can last a couple days. Despite low mortality rates, morbidity is more common after influenza. Recent data suggests that influenza infections has long-term immune consequences for the lungs. People with chronic lung disease such as asthma or COPD are at higher risk for complications related to influenza infection. In some cases, the flu can become more serious and actually lead to pneumonia. The chances of this happening is more common in those with weakened immune systems. Flu treatments mainly aim to relieve symptoms. Medicines available that fight directly against the flu viruses can at most reduce the time someone is sick. Over-the-counter pain relievers are often used to relieve pain and lower fever. Now on to pneumonia. Community acquired pneumonia is considered by many to be the most underestimated disease worldwide. It continues to carry a 10 to 15 percent mortality rate in hospitalized cases. Worldwide, about 200 million cases of viral pneumonia occur every year. 100 million in children and 100 million in adults. It is a bacterial, viral, or fungal infection of one or both sides of the lungs. It can cause the air sacs of the lungs to fill up with fluid or pus. Symptoms can be mild or severe. They may include coughing with phlegm, fevers, chills, and trouble breathing. Many factors affect how serious pneumonia is, such as the type of germs causing the infection, your age, and your overall health. It tends to be more serious for children under the age of five and adults over the age of 65. Other risk factors include environmental factors, lifestyle habits, and certain medical conditions like heart failure, diabetes, and COPD, or people with weakened immune systems like those with HIV, or taking chemotherapy. Children who survive pneumonia have increased risk for chronic lung disease. Adults who survive pneumonia may have worsened exercise ability, cardiovascular disease, cognitive decline, and decreased quality of life for months or years. It can develop in patients already in the hospital for other reasons. Hospital-acquired pneumonia actually has a higher mortality rate out of any other hospital-acquired infection. Treatments for pneumonia is either antiviral or antibiotic medications. Okay, so here are the topics of how H2 might benefit these two sicknesses. So here we go. Number one might sound awfully familiar to you. It is, of course, oxidative stress. This study suggests oxidative stress participates in the pathogenesis of influenza infection and post-infectious fatigue. It says that oxidative damage is increased during acute infection and is persistently elevated despite clinical recovery from influenza infection. And here they found that an influenza A virus induced oxidative stress, cell toxicity, and cell death. Here we see that H2 significantly attenuates oxidative stress in viral patients. It suggests here that hydrogen's role in preventing oxidative damage 
aids to the protection of the lungs. And here it suggests that hydrogen is a promising potential treatment for diseases associated with oxidative stress, inflammation, and cell death. Finally, here it says H2 treatment reduce oxidative stress and cell death in the lungs. Number two is another popular topic, inflammation. Seasonal influenza A virus causes inflammation in the large airways. Inflammation and injury may also spread to the lower airways during more severe influenza infections. But here they found that hydrogen reduces airway inflammation. It also mentions here that hydrogen protects against lung injury by reducing pro-inflammatory cytokines. Here hydrogen treatment significantly improve blood oxygenation and reduce inflammatory events. And here we see hydrogen may be an effective and novel strategy for lung inflammation. Number three is not one we've seen before in previous videos. It is the benefit for the immune system. Adaptive immunity has received growing attention for determining the outcome of pneumonia. The benefit of hydrogen has been implicated in immune processes and innate immune activation. Here we see that hydrogen was able to aid in the prevention of damage to white blood cells. And finally, it shows here that hydrogen was able to regulate immune response. Number four is a little more complicated, but a very big deal. One of the biggest ways hydrogen does what it does is indirectly instead of direct. It upregulates, downregulates, activates, inactivates, basically balancing out pathways and gene expression that can throw the body all out of whack. Here it says that identifying the pathways involved in protecting cells from injury during influenza infection may be particularly important for developing new therapeutic strategies. So let's look how this works specifically when it comes to influenza and pneumonia. NRF2 is a signaling pathway in our bodies that regulates the expression of antioxidants. Recently, clinical trials have been done to determine the therapeutic value of NRF2 in the treatment of lung diseases. This is what we know. Their NRF2 mediated antioxidant system is essential to protect the lungs from oxidative injury and inflammation. Some studies have found that NRF2 is a novel regulator of the innate immune response that dramatically improves survival by protecting against dysregulated inflammation. This study says that mice lacking NRF2 were highly susceptible to the influenza infection. And here they noticed that the NRF2 deficient mice exhibited severe inflammation throughout the lungs. And the mortality rate of the NRF2 deficient mice were significantly higher. NRF2 may play a pivotal role in protection against the oxidant-induced exacerbation of influenza virus by the upregulation of antioxidants. So here it says the hydrogen is a novel activator of the NRF2 pathway with therapeutic potential. It also says the hydrogen ameliorated lung injury by modulating the NRF2 pathway. These results suggest that hydrogen could suppress excessive inflammatory responses and endothelial injury via the NRF2 pathway. And here it says hydrogen significantly promoted the expression of the NRF2 pathway in septic organs, including the lungs. Let's look at another indirect pathway that hydrogen has potential for. This signaling pathway is called NF-kappa B. One of its main functions is to express pro-inflammatory genes. Here we see that an active NFKB pathway is necessary for the influenza virus infection of human cells. The flu virus infection is actually dependent on this pathway being active. This study shows that cells with low NFKB activity were virtually resistant to the influenza virus infection, but they became susceptible upon activation of NF-kappa B. This study found hydrogen reduced airway inflammation and remodeling via its ability to inactivate NFKB. And here we see one way hydrogen exerts its protective role is by reducing NFKB's activity in lung tissues. It says here that molecular hydrogen treatments reducing lung inflammation and cell death is associated with decreased NF-kappa B activity. I got one more for you. Interleukin-22 is a gene that promotes immunity improves regeneration and protects against damage. It has redundant, protective, or pathogenic functions during autoimmune, inflammatory, and infectious diseases. The data indicates that interleukin-22 is required for normal lung repair after influenza infection. Ultimately, it may improve patient outcome in regard to secondary challenges after influenza infection. Here it says hydrogen actually increases interleukin-22 levels as well as interleukin-10. Again, it says here that H2 can elevate anti-inflammatory cytokine interleukin-10 
and lung tissue. So for the fifth topic, we're going to take a look at edema, particularly edema or excess fluid in the lungs. Fluid in the lungs can be a major characteristic of pneumonia. Conditions in human beings that are known to be complicated by lung edema are also known to be associated with increased susceptibility to secondary bacterial pneumonia. Lung edema is also a component of the fully developed influenza viral lesion. Here it says hydrogen improves lung function and lung edema. This study demonstrated that hydrogen was able to indirectly eliminate extravascular lung water. In this study, the lung wet to dry ratio was observed. The ratio is an indicator of the magnitude of pulmonary edema. With H2, there was a significant decrease in this ratio, indicating that H2 has benefit to relieve edema. In this study, we see hydrogen actually ameliorated airway mucus production and damage. And finally, this study concluded that hydrogen could be promising in treating mucus hypersecretion. Now, the last topic, we only have a couple quotes for, but it's important to go over. That is, of course, hydrogen's effect on viruses. This study mentioned that hydrogen water can have a suppressive effect on viral replication. And to quote this study, the benefit of hydrogen have also been implicated in immune processes, such as the immune response to viral infection and vaccination and innate immune activation. It is therefore a great interest to validate the biological function of hydrogen in these immune processes. So with all that being said, what peace of mind will you have during the next flu season? I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a lot about hydrogen. Be sure to share this video and maybe together we can lower the burden of influenza and pneumonia. Stay tuned for the next episode in the series about kidney disease. That's your dose of H2 in two minutes for every season.